hearing room. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, Ms. Jallo. Welcome back. Thank you. How was your break? It was okay. Yeah. I'd like to remind you that you're still under oath. Right. Prior to the lunch break, you were talking about an event at Kanilai, and you mentioned that you were asked, meaning you and the other winners, um, to be at Kanilai for three days from the 29th to the 31st of January. Right. So you um, counted it as 29, 30, 31st. And it was in order for Jame to hold this annual farmer's market where he would look at the produce of the farmers and buy them. Right. You said, um, you talked about what happened upon arrival. You also talked about a gamo that was held, if I'm not mistaken, on the second night. And you said that at some point, Jame himself left, um, that is the former president, Yaya Jame, left to pray Fajr. Right. And right. after that, you were all able to then go home right. um, and finally sleep. So right. this would have been around 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what happened um, the day after that? Um. The day after that, in the morning, we had, um, we had, Jimbi had done shopping, or someone else did, but she brought some food stuff, and we cooked in the corridor, in the veranda of the house that we were living in, all of us. Um, I think we cooked either Benechin or Mbahal, but it was a one-pot uh, meal that we cooked, and we had a whole conversation was going on, just a group of girls sitting together, and Jimby generally had a keen interest in somehow throwing in questions of um, can Monica send Fari, as in who are your boyfriends, you know, um, but in a joking way, like, oh, yen, yen, you girls. So it was a conversation around that, and of course, most people were trying to avoid it and laugh it off and 
talk about other things. Um, before we also finished or we dispersed from there, I remember going to the washroom and um, there was a moment that I had with Jimby where she told me that we should go shopping when we get back and that um, she wants to get really close to me and it will be nice to go and buy some stuff. And on that day, um, there was some kind of student's match pass that was done for the president and some other event that happened before we left back for um, Banjul, um, Serkunda. Yeah. So during that entire period that you were at Kanilai, right. did you have any um, private conversations with the president or any um, personal interactions? Because you mentioned that whenever he saw you, he would act forgetful as though he couldn't remember your name. Right. Um, but did you have any actual um, conversations? No. Um, my whole time in Cunning Life for the three days, I've never seen him personally or privately. I've never been to the residence without the rest of the girls. Um, the little interaction we had was when I was asked to move from the back seat to the front of the seat next to him. And he was saying something about bull and finella, or like, don't sleep and, and that. That is the only verbal um, interaction that he was actually referring to me. Other than that, for the whole three days, um, there was no private meeting or conversation with him. Did you, as a group, um, go to the residence at any point during those three days? Yes, when we went for this gummo that was at his residence. That was the only time? Yes. So after your conversation with um, Jim Bejame, where she said we should go shopping, um, nothing else happened at Kanilai. You said you left Kanilai. Yeah. Um, did you eventually hear from Jimbe after that regarding the shopping? Yes. When we came back from Kanilai, she did reach out to me um, to be picked up by London and that I will meet with, him, with her at Westfield Junction, um, the junction that leads the Kairaba Junction and Westfield, yeah. And would this be Landing Sanyang? Yes, same the driver. same driver, yeah. Do you recall how many days after your return from Kanilai this, um, this took place? How many days after? A day or two. Sorry? A day or two. A day or two. Somewhere around there. Um, so can you tell me, well, tell us what happened um, when, you, when you got to Westfield? Um, we got there, and Jimby was also there coming from... Um, Banjul, I would presume, um, and then we met, we walked on that Kairaba Avenue Road, um, no, we were in the car, and the car dropped us at Ayub Furnitures first, I think it's Ayub Furnitures on um, Kairaba Avenue, and then we went in and we looked at a few chairs, and um, she said that she didn't get like the, she didn't see the leather that she would rather prefer and she asked me to look around too as to what color um, I would want and I remember telling her that not very bright colors because we have a lot of kids we moved from that store we drove back to another store it is on your left hand side on Kairaba Avenue and I think it is the first furniture um, furniture store, either an Indian store or a NAR store, but a furniture store. And that is where we ended up buying um, a closet for a bedroom with a bed. Um, so that is a bed set. Um, I remember her taking out about $75,000 to give to the guy. Um, also couch, a couch set for a living room and a table, um, and they were brown in color, and I also think the table came with a carpet, a carpet, yeah. Um, so this was to be sent for delivery later in the evening, and they're going to put it in a car. And then um, also went to a store on the road, I don't remember, but it's a clothing store all on the Kairaba Avenue Road. And she bought um, a few clothes from there. There was a, a white top. There was a 
dress and um, um, a short dress that was to my knees and there was another dress that went all the way down and um, a blazer I remember too so she bought them um, I'm not sure how much she paid for them um, but we did um, um, buy buy that and then we headed home so who chose the clothes that um, she bought presumably for you right um, yes so she will pick it up and she will ask me if I liked it and I will say yes or no did she tell you where the money for shopping came from no she didn't did she tell you why she was taking you shopping um, she didn't, but the, uh, on that day, but the day before in Kanilai, when she said that we should go shopping, she said something along the lines of, winners get, do get a lot of things. Yeah. But no indication as to where the money was coming from, or who was funding that? I think she did make mention of the money coming from Yaya Jame. So after you um, bought a lot of furniture and some clothes, right. you said that um, you then went home. So the furniture right. was supposed to be delivered, but the clothes you took with you, is that right? Yes. Um, what happened after that? The furniture was delivered at the house. Yeah. When that furniture arrived at your house, um, what did your parents say? What was their reaction? Um, I called my mom on my way before I got there because I don't want her to be surprised and she didn't know that this arrangement has been made. And um, she did ask Jimby, is this part of the, um, the package? And um, I remember my mom telling me that she asked someone at the ministry, I don't remember who, who said that when the girls win, what they get is not systematic it's not like written on a paper that this is what you get and that's what you don't get it is different from every winner and it's different every year um, so Jimby just made mention that it is just a gift um, and it is part of the gifts that you get for winning yeah so your understanding was that the president has given this money and this was because you were the winner I believed that because I do not, I did not have um, an example of how to compare to the other winners before me. Because I do not know what the other winners got and did not get. So whatever was brought onto the table, and that it was because I won, I assume it was part of it. Maybe other people got it. Maybe they didn't, or they even had more. I wasn't sure. So yeah. Apart from the furniture stores that you mentioned, as right. well as the clothing store, right. did you go anywhere else with Jim Bay prior to going home? Um, we had an incident at um, Q, Q Cell where she um, tried to activate my Apple, my Apple phone that we were given. Um, so I did not have an Apple ID at the time because I never had an iPhone. Um, Maybe start by telling us how that came about, the decision to go to QCell and... Um, right. Um, so I could not do much with my phone because I did not um, activate the phone. As you know, with iPhone, iPhones, you need an um, Apple ID to activate it. And I did not have one. So Jimby suggested that she knew someone at, st um, at QCell who does um, phone stuff and he walks there so the process would be fast. And then we went to QCell to do that. Um, what is the name of the individual that you saw when you went to QCell to um, unlock your phone? Jimby referred to him as Patrick Jaju. So when you arrived at QCell, what did Patrick Jaja do to your phone? Um, he took the phone and then he started to set it up. He first asked me if I had an Apple ID and I said no. Um, and he asked if I could create one in the moment. I said no and he's like, okay, don't worry. I have an Apple ID that I, have, I hardly used or I haven't used much. 
I will use it to like unlock the phones and then um, activate it and you can use it at the time I did not know that Apple IDs are not just to unlock a phone but also it gives you access to information on that phone or to the iCloud of that phone but um, he used his whether it was his or someone else but he used an Apple ID to unlock the phone that I was uh, that I was going to be using and then um, activated my SIM card and then the whole process that you do yeah yeah I know you said that at that point you didn't know um, that someone logging into your phone with, a, with an Apple ID would give them access to things like your cloud and other information. Right. Um, but what made you comfortable enough to allow him to, um, to do that with your phone? Was there anything in particular that made you comfortable enough? Right. So at the time, especially with phones that we do not understand, you let people activate it for you or if you bought um, a new phone and it is locked mostly it is locked there is this thing that um, happens in the Gambia where you have to unlock um, I guess international phones or there is um, for you to be able to access to use that phone um, so to me it was something similar he was doing he was unlocking the phone and setting it up for me to use not that he was putting in an Apple ID and I did not understand what the function of Apple ID means like in details as in it could save my information and pictures and all of that. I didn't know so I was comfortable with um, that. Yeah. Did Patrick Jaju appear to know Jimbe? Yes. What gave you that impression? Um, they greeted each other like um, how is work, um, they went into conversations that you will have someone that you're familiar with when she walked in she did not just um, uh, meet Patrick as what well, because there were so many tellers at the counter she specifically um, asked for him and he was right there and they greeted each other so that made me know that they kind of know each other I don't know to what extent though so after um, your phone was unlocked at QSL, right. do you recall if um, what you used at that point was a SIM card that you owned previously or was it a new SIM card? I think it's the same SIM card. It was just moved from my old phone to the new one. And what happened to your old phone? Um, I gave it to my dad, I think. So it was after this trip that um, you went back home, correct? Yes. And you said the furniture was delivered. It was delivered. Was it the same day or the next day? Um, the same day. The same In day. The evening. Yeah. Did you have any other discussions with Jimbe on that day? Um, no, I can't recall. Did she um, arrive? Did she enter the house when you arrived? Um. Partly, I think. Not that she sat down, or but I think she, she came in, yeah. Did she have a conversation with any other member of your family apart from you? My mother, who was questioning if this was part of the package. And from what you said, um, her response was, yes, it is. Yes. So what happened after that? What was the next interaction that you had with either Jimbe or the president at the time? Um, so now we are into February. Um, February, we, we are still into February, so February 17th, now this is the day before the Independence Day, which is the 18th of February. There was, um, there's this whole preparation and celebration of the Independence Ceremony. Um, so a night before the independence celebration was an event they called a, re a reception that also happened at um, a hotel and um, on that day the band called Morgan Heritage from the Caribbean were performing and uh, uh, I took the pic this picture with them around 1142 so we got there before that um, 
So we spent that whole night, we were basically standing, there were tables with drinks on it, um, and there were some of the girls, some were picked to be ushers, I wasn't part of them, but there were some of the girls that were part of the usher team that was ushering that event. Um, interacted with the girls, the um, chaperone, Auntie Isa, from the gender department was there the whole time. Um, I did not see the president personally. He was not um, present in that crowd. It was just artists performing and um, us being there. So we went home. And um, before that, in between, there is also this whole sewing of asobis, because we had several asobis that we have um, sewn for the event. So at 12 of 16 on February 18, which is the Independence Day, we are already at the stadium. Um, we had a Yaya Jamme um, Asobi on. Um, what is a Yaya Jamme Asobi? Um, it is a clothing with Yaya Jamme's face on it. It was um, uh, APRC clothing that a lot of people were wearing. It was the team of that event. I'm not sure if you've said this already, but where was the reception held? Um, at a hotel, I think Coco Ozan again, yeah. And you said um, you took another picture at 12.16, is that a.m.? Didn't, no, that's on Friday, uh, p.m. On p.m., yes. so on the 18th itself, Yes. in the afternoon. <coughs> Did anything else happen on that? on that day, the actual Independence Day celebration? It was all um, general. We were sitting behind. Um, the normal Independence celebration that happens went on, the parade and everything, and we were there the entire time. And when it was time to go home, we went home. Um, we saw Jimby, of course, who said hi to us, uh, but there was no interaction with her deeply or with the president or um, any of the officials there. And we did not have any official role, but we were present. And that event would have been at? At the stadium, at the stadium. in Bacau. Yeah. So after the Independence Day celebration, <laughs> when was the next time that you had any interaction with either the president or Jim Bejame? So on that day of the celebration, to note, on the 18th of um, February, after the whole day celebration of the parade, we also um, had dinner that same night. Um, our table, us and the girls, again, we wore the same clothing, but this was our own, um, a dinner dress. So at 12 of 23, we spent, we spent the whole night there because there were fireworks that were going on. So on that day, I did see the president, and the first lady was also present. And I remember that day Sona Jabate was performing. And it was after her performance that the president and the Audleys were saying that they're going to the back where you have the, the beach and they will do fireworks. So we were all standing there with the president, president in the front and the first lady. And fireworks went on um, until about 4.22. We were still um, there at the fireworks. Um, yeah, so February 20th, which is also another day after the 19th, um, there was a wrestling match at Makati Square where we were also invited. Um, and a jambori was also happening. So we were sitting where the VIP sits, the president in the front. There was musical performance and also wrestling between local wrestlers. That also went on until 3 a.m. again with all of the other girls. Um, and where was this um, this particular event held? Makati Square in Banjul. Um, so you told us earlier that as a result of many events and activities you had to attend, which went <coughs> which um, went throughout the night into the early hours of the morning, you right. started to miss um, a lot of days at school. Right. What happened after February 20th? Um, February 20th all the way into the morning because we were still at the wrestling. Um,
On March 26, what I can remember was I got an acceptance letter from one of the universities that I've applied to, um, which I applied to four days after I first um, met the president. Um, so fast, fast forward to May 25th, before, which is a... Sorry, just yeah. before May, May 25th. Um, what led you to actually start applying um, for the scholarships? You mentioned that, of course, one of the um, conditions you had to fulfill was to finish your project and submit right. it. Um, but did anyone tell you, okay, go ahead and actually apply for schools um, right. because you would get a scholarship? Right. Again, as I said earlier, we did not have the conversation around that. I applied, as I said, I've been applying for universities before I even joined the pageant. But I applied for it looking at the time, time span of when the application might be accepted and all the processes that you have to do with your passport, site picture, that by the time it is either accepted or not accepted, I would be further into the project or done with it and I would be able to walk on the university instead of waiting until I am done with the project to start fresh and have to wait because we are already in, um, already in May and um, the meeting happened in January. so. So that's like four to five months um, in between before they responded to me. So that was the time gap I was calculating. But I didn't apply because I was asked to by either the ministry or the president himself. So to be clear, up until that point, so right. from when you won the pageant up until, let's say, May 25th, right. no one had spoken to you about a scholarship or even the fact that you should apply for no. anything? What happened in between all of this that was an interaction with the Ministry of Education was that, apart from the events that we went to, was that we were supposed to provide pictures. Now, it wasn't explained to us what these pictures were for, but we were supposed to provide a full length picture and we took the pictures ourselves. I called a local photographer in our neighborhood who came and took a picture of me the other girls did the same, and we are supposed to bring in the pictures at the gender department at the Ministry of Education. Do you recall when this took place? When were you asked to take full-length pictures? I do not remember the dates. I know it happens in the midst of all this. Um, do you by any chance know if it happened before or after Independence Day? I'm not no. sure. But it would have been sometime in 2015 itself. Yes, sometime in 2015. And um, what were you told about who had requested the full length um, photographs? Did they tell you who had requested it or why it was really being requested? No. Um, what was said was that, oh, um, the State House needs a full length pictures of all of you. Um, the question of why was never explained. At that point, did you wonder why? Um, at that point, um, no, I can't remember how or how I took it at that time. Um, but I was thinking is in relations to us for a second. I thought it was in relations to the scholarship but I couldn't see how it fit into that because it was not a passport size picture. So apart from that, you started to mention the 25th of May, right. 2015. Um, tell us what happened on that day. I think the president's birthday is May 25th or May around there, but there was a celebration at the state house Yes, his birthday celebration, was it the day before or on that day, but on the, on the May of 25th at 11.22 um, p.m., that's when I took this picture, and uh, we were going to the State House. There's a big tent that was um, rented on the outside on the, in the lawns of the State House, and then we went there, and I remember the daughter of the late Lucky Doobie from the Caribbean performed there. And there were speeches, and there were tables, and there were dinners, and all that. Again, it was with me and the girls, and with Auntie Aisha the Separan. I did not have an interaction with the president on that day. 
So after the 25th of May, when was the next time that you either interacted with the president or spoke to Jim Bejame? Um Just later, later around that same time, it was definitely before the end of um, May. Um, I Jimby asked me to go to um, visit the president again. So this time around the same proce process, Landing came and picked me up at home. Um, we went and King Papa was there. My bag was taken as usual with my phone. Again, in a different, we were in a different room this time around, but also a family room because the pictures of the then First Lady were also hanged in that room. Um, you said this was before the end of May, is that correct? Yes, so... So a few days to, after the birthday celebration. A few days after the birthday celebration. Do you recall um, around what time um, landing came for you? It's always in the evenings. Um, um, this one was also a bit earlier, sometime around around nine. Yeah. And again, we're referring to the same driver, Landing Sanyang. Yes. So when you arrived at State House, you said it was a different residence or a different room? A different room in the same residence. So yeah. by the same residence, you mean the family residence that you went to? The first and the second the time, yeah. Okay. Um, so tell, tell us what happened when you arrived there. Um, my bags and my phones were taken as usual. Um, I got in with Jimby and this time around we waited for two hours um, before he came in the room. And then um, he came in. On that day, the conversation <coughs> was... Sorry, who is he? The ex-president. Please continue. Um, he was very much interested, I think before he said what he was planning to say on that day, he wanted to know my perspective on certain things. On that day he was interested in what I think about the APRC and also if my father was part of any political party. He was also interested in if I listened to Fatu radio and if I listened to the Freedom Pandeiri. Um, to which I replied to him that I do not listen to that and I hardly have data on my phone. Um, but those were questions that he was very interested in on that, um, on that particular night. Before you saw the president, how long did you wait? Two hours. About two hours. Yeah. And um, when you had that conversation, was there anything going on in particular? What was the purpose of your visit, or were you, was it over a meal, or were you just sitting in oh. the living room watching TV? What was, right. what was the So setting? it was on the basis of the last time, remember when he said that I will get money for the project, but it will, he will call me to come and get the money. So this day was apparently the day that I was supposed to receive the money for the project. So that's what I was there for. But again, the TV was on, and we were having this whole other conversation. Um, yeah. So apart from asking you questions about your um, political support or affiliation, including that of your family, as well as um, asking if you um, listen to or frequent um, FATU Network, Freedom Newspaper, what else did he talk about? Um, he did go back to my age again. Am I sure that I am the age that I say I am? Um, he then also went on to ask, what do I think of marriage? And um, we also got into, I remember, conversations around feminism and, you know, what do I think about it? Um, and in between that, a call was also made. Um, it's either he called the wife or the wife called him and they were on the phone, the same normal exchanges of um, good night. I don't know where she was. Um, they spoke on the phone and then he hanged up the phone. And when he hung up the phone casually, he said to me, um, okay, like, let's get this over it. Um, would you like want to marry me, right? Also, 
as casual as Yajame can be. So I didn't ask him um, as in, like, you mean to marry you? He said yes. Now, um, as a lot of people, the expectation in this moment is um, I'm supposed to be excited. There is no way that this was not the best news of my life. The dynamics here of what put me back, it's not because someone wanted to marry me. It's because from the very second that I walked into a room with Yaya Jame, he did not in any shape or form show me that he is interested in me, he likes me, or said anything in that regard. From the very second we interacted, he showed me that he was a father. A father figure is what he showed me, and I've gotten comfortable around him within that perimeter. So when he asked me if he wanted to marry me, in order to be excited, in order to want to, it must have been something that I have processed along the way or seen along the way, but I was set aback because a father has just broken what it is that we have kind of built. So I thought it was a joke, and I thought, oh, maybe he's testing me. Because Yajambe has told me time and time again to not concentrate on men, to not mind men, to concentrate on my career and my education. So to me, I thought it was a test, especially after talking immediately from talking with his wife. Um, he went on to say that, but you're beautiful. And when I then I realized, okay, he actually meant what he said. I said to him, I do not want to get married right now. Um, and it's not because of you or anyone, is that I do not intend to be married at this age. And me and him had half conversation about early marriages and what women should be doing, and we've had those conversations. So that is what I was trying to reiterate. And then he said, there is nothing wrong with getting married to a man that is taking care of you, that is supporting you, to say. In, in what language were you having this conversation? Mostly English. Mostly English. And so after you um, responded that it wasn't about him, um, right. you just weren't ready to get married, what did he say? What was his reaction? Um, before he, before that, he asked to um, who was my boyfriend, and then I remember asking, "Oh, um, I didn't answer it. I kind of snoops the question in a way," and then he said that, "You know, I am the president, right? And I can know whatever I want to know in this country." Um, but we didn't go further into that, and he did not insist. But before I left before I got my money that he sent um, Kim Papa or Jimbi to go and get. He said that maybe I did not hear him right and then I need to go and think about it. And he had this smug smile on his face like come, like you're not hearing me. You do not understand what this is or you think it is some type of a joke. Um, but he did tell me to go and think about it. Yeah. How did you feel now that the conversation had clearly taken a different, um, a different angle altogether? Initially, you said you felt he was a father figure. He gained your trust. Right. There are a few things that maybe made you apprehensive along the way, right. but you were still comfortable. At this point, having, having had a marriage proposal made and questions being asked about whether you have a boyfriend, and the fact that you were told, go and think about it. How did you feel at that point? I, I kind of um, 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 felt like, felt a little deceived and that I have lost this father figure sentiment in a way because deep down no matter what I told myself deep down I understood that whatever it is that I thought this was or whatever it is that I built this around is not 
what it is and there was so much trust and so much confidence so so in that moment it was just like oh I was let's to summarize it I was disappointed but that was me deep down but on the outside I was trying to convince myself and and I say to myself oh like he's just testing you he's he just wants to see you know if you are having an interest if what he's been telling you has been getting into your head or that's that's what I did tell myself so there is this there was this two sides to um, what I was feeling so after this conversation you said either Jimbe or King Papa someone gave you the money that had been promised to you for your project right, right. Um, do you recall how much money was given to you? Um, so I don't know if you remember in our second meeting when I told him that I had $60,000 budgeted and then he said that they could increase that amount to $100,000. Um, but when Kim Papa brought in the money this time around for the same said project, it was $50,000. And you're certain that the person who brought in the money was King Papa? Because um, you said earlier that right. either Jimbe or King Papa went to get the money. One of them, because there were the two present there, apart from Yaya Jame and myself. Um, so did King Papa bring it from wherever the money normally is? Um, or Jimbe did? I'm not sure. But one thing I know for um, sure is um, the oddlies normally carry either his money or they would they likely to go get where the money is than Jimbi herself um, so I don't know who brought it from the outside but the money was given to me when the money was given to you right. was anything said at that point right um, so also this is where it becomes ironic because the money was supposed to be for the project again way less than what I have proposed and what he has proposed but when the money was given to me he's like oh it is for the bother of your coming but he said it in Wolof that's why it comes off like that that it is for the bother of your coming that he gave the money to me for and who said this exactly? The ex-president. So what happened after that? Um, said bye to each other as usual and then um, I went home. Do you recall who took you home that night? Landing Sanya. Did anything else happen um, that night? Um, that night when I left to go home? Mm. No, nothing happened. When you went home, um, either that night or the next day, did you inform your parents of the proposal, the marriage proposal that the president had made to you? I never did because I never took it seriously and I never had interest in it. So I did not share that information with my mom or my dad and I also know how my mom would react to an information like that. So you didn't tell your parents, did you tell anyone else about this? No, my parents are the closest to me. If I did not tell them, I, I wouldn't tell anyone else. So what happened in the days after that proposal? The days after that is when it started to get a little bit weird. So um, I remember my friend Apsa calling me and telling me, it's so hard to reach you whenever I call you. There's always this gushing line or it seems like it connects back to something and then connects right back to you. Um, I felt like I was being followed I didn't think at the time I was being followed because I was of any kind of threat. I just thought that what he had told me, he's trying to make sure that I am not in the premises of the Gambia College talking about 
President B said this, President B wanted to mar said he wants to marry me. I remember vividly an uh, English teacher of mine at the college called Mr. Fane. In his office, I would sit there and uh, I would tell him to come out of the office and peep because there's this car that I felt like was following me and was standing there the whole time. And s when I come out to go home, this car moves as well. And I remember him telling me, I think you're just paranoid. I think you're paranoid. And I remember telling that Mr. Fane, something very weird happened between me and the president. I did not tell him that he has proposed to me or he said that he would want to marry me. Um, did he mean that? I don't know. Did he say it as a way of making me feel important in that moment? I do not know. I could not gauge the sincerity of um, that statement. But the following days has been that. Um, it's either I was paranoid and I was all in my head or it was actually happening. Um, what kind of vehicle was following you around? Can you describe it? A black it? car. Was there anything particular about it? Um, it wouldn't normally have a number plate. That is uh, the only distinction to it. Was it um, a big car or a small car? It was a Jeep. And do you by any chance rem remember the model? Or of no. The car? no. Um, so you said you pointed that out to the Mr. Fane? Mr. Fane, yeah. Mr. Fane. Where else did you see a vehicle like that following you around? Um, most of my activities, because when I got up, I would go to the Gambia College, so it was between Brikama and um, Yundum. And I was going to, I remember, judging drama debates at Nusrat High School for the, um, the, the PI Health Group. Also, when I went to Alliance Franco to judge the Miss Fulbe, there was a Miss Fulbe um, um, pageantry that was happening, and I was part of the judges. So, but, but it was mostly around that. It's either I am going to mentor some of the, 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 the young ones that I seniored in Newstrat, or I was between Alliance Franco, or, um, um, but mostly at Newstrat and Gambia College and Yundum. Yeah. So how many days after the president proposed marriage did you hear from either him or Jimbe or anyone else at State House? Um, so I did hear from Jimbe um, after that happened in the last week of May. I think it was the beginning of June. Jimby said that he, she wanted to show me something. Now, this is after the proposal has been made. Um, I went with Jimby. Jimby took me to um, one of the AU villas. I've never been there before. And we got off the car, and she pointed out a home that we got into. The gate was open. There was a monkey in um, one of the trees in the home. And then she said to me um, something around... Um, like this will be your home and uh, I said okay and she said this will be your home is very private and um, a car and I said okay but he said so why are you not happy and I told Jimby that I told you and I told the president I do not want to get married I would appreciate the home I don't have an if you give it to me I will take it if you give me the car too I will take it, but that I need to get that on the circumstance of marrying, that is not something I want to do. And for the first time, Jimby actually not indirectly, not um, pretending not to be in the know-how, said to me and asked, um, what is wrong with you? And she said it from in Wolof, Lalmola Jot, um, do you know how many people will kill to get this opportunity, right? And so she was, she was a bit mad about that. When the president made the marriage proposal, um, the evening that you were at State House, was anyone present at that time? Um, were Jimbe or King Papa present when the marriage proposal was made? Jimbe had gone out earlier to get um, 
she said she was going to do something or she had an engagement of some sort but she came back when that conversation about the marriage was happening Jimby was present King Papa was not present but after that night the first time that you had this conversation with her was when she took you on tour to see the AU Villa after that night yes so after you um, after she reacted the way she did um, mm -hmm. basically asking what's wrong with you um, what happened next um, she then said that landing should take me home and, and I got into the car she got into the car that brought her back to Banjul and for the first time again landing is saying something to me in regards to anything related to this scene so landing asked me Yangi fine like are you all right I said yes then landing said to me um, all I can tell you is to be very careful Jimby is a very powerful person at the state house that was all he said I do not know what that statement meant or what he was trying to get to but he did tell me to be careful and that Jimby is a very powerful person in the state house so up until that point your understanding of the house and the car was that you would get that if you married the president yes it was not being given to me on that day it was so in me that this is what is um, available what is possible if you what do is say possible. yes yeah. um, after that you went home um, did you inform anyone about what had happened that day no I did not what did you do after that um, after that was when I um, decided to block Jimby's number um, but she can always reach me with her no caller ID anyways so I started to kind of avoid her calls I remember on two three occasions between this um, um, time after this happened a day she called me and the phone was ringing my mom which was in my room I told my mom pick the phone uh, my mom said why I said pick it and tell her that I am sick um, another time I told my mom to pick up the phone and tell her that I was not around that I had left the house and my mom will always ask me why are you avoiding Jimby's calls and I will tell her she, you know she likes inviting me to these events I am tired of going to these events that's why um, another time when she actually called and I told her I was sick this time around she did not take it she said what's wrong with you you've always been sick you're always saying you're sick I'm going to send landing to your house to come and take you to the hospital to check what is wrong with you or to find you medication because you're always sick whenever I call you now and I told her no I will be fine I will just take medication she insisted landing came to my house um, she picked me up we went to RVTH in Banjul. Um, we went for an x-ray um, 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 x-ray thing that happened and I believe that happened because when I was telling her I was sick I told her something about my chest again this was not true it was all excuses I was making up because I did not want to go to for whatever she was calling me because at this point I've already established what this is about um, when we got there there was an Indian doctor I did not know him I did not interact with him Landon did not introduce me to him neither was I introduced to um, neither was he introduced to me um, then he ordered for us to go to um, whatever technician was responsible for scanning I went in there they took my bread pressure they took me into um, the scanning room and they scanned my chest which is the scan um, I gave you yesterday um, and then I came out so there were results um, I have not seen the results of that um, uh, um, report of that um, x-ray scan I just had the x-ray was given to me but it's just an x-ray there's no description of what happened or what the x-ray is actually saying so was the results given to landing and then landing took them back to Jim B I'm not sure but the results were not given to me I do not have them up to this date 
um, but they gave me some medicine for um, indigestion and also for chest pain and then um, I went I went home London dropped me off home so am I right in understanding that this would have been um, in early June 2015 let's say at this point, Landing had already told you that um, Jim Bay is a very powerful person at State House, according right. to what you said. Right. But you still went on to block her number and try to avoid her. Right. What, at that point in time, how did you feel about what was happening and um, the fact that from what you've said, you, had, you hadn't told anyone about it? So how did you feel at that point? What was going through your mind? regarding the entire incident? Um, I thought in that moment is that I did have a choice that if Jim B is calling me to come to this and I do not want to do it anymore, I do not want to come because at this point we are no longer talking about any type of project, we are done with that. And if Jim B is going out of her way to even show me that anger on that day to say, what, um, like, who does that? What kind of person are you? It means that she's angry with me. And the whole vibe was not fine. And someone that she's walking with, who's a driver, is also telling me that she is powerful. So it was all just mixed up together. So in my own little 19-year-old head, the best thing I can do is... Um, cut out Jimby, mind my business, as long as I'm not doing anything bad, as long as I'm not mentioning anybody's name, I'm not out there to give any type of information and I just wake up and go to school and come back, that I would be fine. Um, that was a game plan that I assume that I've, I've had um, written down, that everything is going to be fine and everything is going to be okay. And I'm going to keep giving excuses. Every time she calls me, I'm going to say I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I was not also calculating for how long could that go on for. Um, but yes. So after that, when was the next time that you saw Jim Bejame or anyone else um, from State House? Um, it was before Ramadan. I'm not sure what date Ramadan was in 2015. Um, but I did receive a call from Jim B again and she said that it's been a while and that there is a Quran recitation at the State House, the normal gamma that we do have and um, so I took my, my veil and my dress and I remember asking her if the other girls are there. And then she said, yes, the other girls are there. So it was an official gathering, so it was okay to go because this is not one of those um, that I'm going for a private meeting. Um, and then she said, Jim, uh, G, uh, Landing was coming to pick me up. And Landing did. Um, and then we went to the state house the first door opened as usual and we passed, yeah. Do you remember around what time of the day that was? For Agamo? Uh, I don't know, it was late, so it should be around like 10 for me to get there by 12 or so. Because it's Agamo, so it's like a whole night thing. I It wouldn't start earlier than, yeah, so he would have picked me up around 8, 9, 10 between that time frame. So you arrived at State House very late at night. Um, you went through the first gate, you said? Right. Um, can you tell us where you went? Um, so we passed the garden, and the garden was filled on that day with um, a lot of people were wearing white, um, ministers and other people that normally sit in the VIP are there. The president was not seated. I could not see him sitting there. And our car had to pass to go uh, for me to be on the side or with the driver because the president is coming to take his seat. And if that is happening, cars are not allowed to loiter around there. People are not allowed to be walking around. Or um, everybody just stands up and wait for him to come. Um, so the car went to next to an office 
um, very similar to the one that we um, I went to with the girls the first time we came and we were waiting for the president to finish praying. So I was there and then Jimby said hi to me, Danga Hibon, as in you get sick all the time and uh, that it has been a while and hope I am fine. We had that conversation and we were sitting there and the narrative was the president is taking a seat and as soon as he finishes to take his seat, um, then I can come out and then join behind in the in the group, but I cannot walk around to come and take my seat whilst he's doing the same protocol as Jim uh, as Jimmy will call it. Um, and then um, um, Jimmy said that I and her should move to the next room because some people were coming to use the, um, the room that we were in so we moved to the next room to wait for the president to come and um, that's what we we did we moved to the next room Jimby was there with me she was on her phone and then um, she decided that she was going to go get something water so Jimby left the room and I was seated there um, now we are in the second room apart from where the waiting area is and um, out of nowhere and so unexpectedly the president walks into that same room from a door now, was he there before I got into that space? I don't know. Did he come from, I do not know the building enough to know where he had come from. What kind of room was that? Um, so it's also a waiting area, but it has uh, brown doors, like three of them. I do not know which one of them is an exit and which one of them is a, a bedroom but I get to know that later that that is the that is a bedroom but the other two doors if they were exits or if they were bedrooms as well I do not know that um, so when he walked in again he wasn't all dressed like a ready-made dress as if he was going to take his seat he wasn't wearing his full costume that he wears to to go outside You know, but um, you know, he—he's—I don't know if it was the redness of the eyes was of anger, if the redness of the eyes was something induced. I don't know, but all I know is that his red, his eyes were very red, and um, that scared me for a second. Um. But I, I greeted him and he didn't he didn't respond. And he said to me not in sequence, so so just so you note, there were so many things that were said in between here and during the whole thing. Um and some were said before some, some were not. I say them as I remember them, as some of them are like really stuck with me. Um I do not know what comes before what in a way. But he there were words like who do you think you are? And that he is the president and that he gets any woman that he wants. He pulled his hand to reach out to me, like to kind of grab me. Um, but it was with the back of his hand. It's like if you want to like scare somebody but not really hit them, but we like that, and then held onto my arms here and then he dragged me and opened that door that I was talking about the brown door and inside we were as he pushed me on and then locked the door now this is a small room um, it has a bed which is not very high um, it was white in the room the couch the pillows the bed 
um, the ceiling of the house and there was a washroom there as well. Um, Just take your time. There's a bottle of water next to you if, in case right. you want to drink something. Um, he said, let's see if you are a virgin. And um, I swear to God I was scared right and um, I started to apologize to say that I am sorry I am sorry you know I am so sorry please don't do this I am so sorry um, because he appeared very angry and I was apologizing I don't know if I was apologizing for I don't know what I was apologizing for is it because he's angry or um, what happened before that but he he held my face um, he pulled his pants down and he rubbed his genitals in my face more like ha hands on my head this way but like pulling this way and rubbing I was underneath it's like I was right by his um, pelvis as he rubbed his genitals on my face um, I had a, a dress on and a leggings underneath the dress the dress was more like a, a buyer because it was gummo He pulled my dress up and um, he was just saying, he was just saying things and You want to have a few seconds? When you're ready, just switch on the mic. I keep saying he. Um, I would um, say his name. So Yaya Jame decided to um, um, penetrate me. But before he did, he took out um, um, a needle from his pocket and um, he injected me on my arm I'm not sure of what it is or what it was for um, and unlike in the movies when you are injected you just don't fall immediately um, depending on what it is that has been injected into you Yaya Jambe did not want um, sex with me or pleasure with me what he wanted to do was to hurt me. What he wanted to do 
was to teach me a lesson. What he wanted to do was to manifest his ego. Just like many of us can't believe that a girl can say no, um, someone like Yajambe and in his position found it very disrespectful for um, a 19 year old from not an elite background or not the daughter of a president to somehow gather some kind of audacity to say no to him. Um, that he is a man probably who hasn't had so many no's. And my no wasn't because of um, 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 a sense of um, understanding or I was better off, I wanted to. My no was just because I felt it was wrong. And I felt that it wasn't right. He, I was on the bed, the top part of my body is on the bed, and from my waist down was dangling under, on the ground. Yaya Yame penetrated me after doing the face rubs on my face and talking all the things that probably would arouse him, and somehow my begging and my pleading, or maybe my I am sorry, made him feel better about um, um, what was happening. I said, stop. I was saying, stop. Please don't stop. My nose were very clear, even as I pleaded and said that I was sorry. He wanted to see, and he said, let's see what is here, as he pushed his penis into me. Um, with a pillow right on the bed and my face sh schmoosed into the pillow. I was um, trying to wiggle. And mind you, as all of this is happening, I am hearing the Quranic recitations in the background. The Gamo people were, was going on. The, the, the Imams were preaching outside. I could hear loud and clear, and so could he. Um, 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 the Sukula team were singing praises of the Quran, and all of that was going on because my loudspeakers were being used. So it was loud, and you could hear it from the room as if we were part of the, the Gamo. Yaya Jame was sweating, and um, I don't know why, but he was sweating like a lot. My face moved into the bed, crying for help. When there was none. You know? If you need a minute or two, we can take yeah, a short, okay. short break. The, um, the hardest part of this is um, thinking or imagining that anybody thinks that is not true. Because I feel up to this day, every stretch of my muscle, every stretch, when he penetrated me. He seemed to have been looking for something. Whilst his head was on my back as I was smoothed in the pillow and he was standing on the floor with the rest of my body down, I saw him peeking and looking for something. He 
sodomized me. And what that means is, um, he took his penis and he put it into my anus instead of my vagina. That's what sodomy is. Um, my muscles were hurting and in that moment and um, it wasn't it wasn't like it, it, it he even wanted to take long or it was just so all all just being hurtful all of it was just being hurtful the entire time and whilst he was doing it he was so comfortable with the fact that he has a great cover up that this will never come out, especially in detail, and that uh, no one would believe this. And he has a great cover of imams reading the Quran in the background. Who would have thought that that was happening inside? I, however, I, I felt unconscious at some point. I guess at this time, whatever was in my uh, bloodstream or he injected me has gotten to me now but before that the, the voices started to fade away in my head even the screams that I was screaming I could not hear my screams anymore and I could not also hear most of the the Quran recitation it was all going in the background like a shadow voice you know in the background until it kind of um, faded away and um, I don't know how long I was laying there. I don't know what Yaya Jambe did to me that whole period that I was laying there, what happened. Um, um, but I did get up. I did wake up from that and feeling very disoriented, like I had a very, like if you have a very long nap, like you slept whole day kind of, and you wake up and you're feeling a bit sick because you slept a little too much. That was the feeling that I was having, and I was dizzy. But before I, 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 I lost consciousness or whatever happened in that moment, I did see him grab the same um, 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 leggings that I was wearing that he pulled off and went to the washroom. Now when I got up, um, there's a chair, a white chair too in this room right next to the door. And um, he is leaning back in the chair in his shorts and um, with no shirt on him. And he was just leaning back. And this leggings that I saw him take um, was somehow under on the fan that was standing there. Or probably it's not, but it's a black one, and it looks from similar to my to my leggings. So when I got up, because I'm like uh, moving around, and then I got up, my tears are kind of dried on my face. He told me to to get out. walked out of that door um, he I don't know <laughs> to his gummo I guess or wherever um, Kim Papa who always um, either holds my bag or my phone uh, he was there but my bag and my phone this time around, I didn't get to give it to anyone who bring it in because I was dragged in. So my bag was left under on the chair where I was waiting. And uh, this King Papa that you call Ali, um, um, Ali something, you mentioned his name. Um, he looked at me and said that this is our president and we will do anything to protect him. 
Um, that's why I could not forget his face on any picture and at any moment. Um, grabbed my stuff, left. Jimby was right there at the door. Again, on her phone, pretending like nothing just didn't happen. Went with me. She didn't say a word. I didn't. All the way into the car as we exited the, the, the waiting area. And the black car landing was still there waiting i got into the car and landing took me home the entire trip from there to my home landing didn't say a word to me i didn't say a word to landing i was in the back of the car leaned on the window of the car staring at the the moonlight or whatever li bright light was outside through the dark window because they were tinted glasses. No one outside could see inside, but I could see outside. And I was leaning back there and tears rolling down my eyes the whole time until we got home. And I was numb, just numb. I was in like processing anything. It's just like I just watched a movie of some other person. We got home, Landon dropped me off, Yufana and Ajama never said anything or asked me what was going on or why I am quiet because at least when he picks me up, sometimes he will ask how are you or um, how has it been, um, the other girls, we are going to go pick her, she's at the door, do you want to text her and see if she's there, something. But none of that happened that night. And then I got home and my sister... Um, was the one who was awake. Um, she opened the main gate for me and I came in. Um, I was holding my shoes in my hands. I was not wearing them. She opened the door. She was very sleepy. She woke up from her sleep and then I walked into the room again. Now my mom sees a light sleeper so she heard the door and she opened her bedroom door and peeped through the um, peeped through the, 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 the drape and she said, oh, um, your back is late. I said, yeah, she's like gummo. So she, she understood because it's a gummo that that time is all right to come home. My mom was half asleep. I don't, um, she really didn't look at me enough. She really was just trying to check who opened the door. And when she knew it was me and I was fine, she just went back to her room. And I wasn't also standing there to engage her because I was rushed into my room and her door is right there. So I went into my room and then I locked my door. Now, the lo longest night of my life, right? In that moment, I haven't even processed anything and I haven't um, even like try understood what exactly happened and I was saying to myself this is the most powerful man in Gambia you know who am I for anybody to listen to to believe to and where do I say this and when I say it wh what what am I expecting what do I think is going to happen and also, this did not happen. I was in so much denial. I went into the washroom. I took my um, 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 uh, my cloth, my washcloth, and I was in the washroom for like more than an hour, just washing and showering and washing and everything. My my ears felt like you know when it is raining, and you blocked your ear. You block your ear with your two hands. That was noise that you hear everything was just blurry like we were in another day or in another timeline i showered brushed off washed off went to my bed and laid down and i was telling myself this did not happen this did not happen it did not happen um but that is what happened on the night um that yeah Jamie raped me and that is how he did it What you've explained um, quite 
clearly is rape, so I'm not going to belabor the point by asking you additional questions just to get more information. Um, you talked about the physical force he used. You talked about um, the fact that you were apologizing, trying to say no, trying to get him to stop. You talked about the fact that he then penetrated you in the anus. Um, I don't know if he penetrated any other part of your body. Um, you talked about what happened to your clothes. You talked about feeling pain um, in your body. And you also talked about um, the fact that he injected you with um, a needle and you don't know what was in that. You also talked about hearing the Quranic recitation. You talked about what happened after, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. But simply to ask you how you felt at that point when all of this was happening. And immediately after that, how you really felt. I don't know. I, I, I don't really know um, up to this date, no amount of experience, no, no amount of um, resilience has, um, has um, taught me the right words to use to describe that moment. But I, I just lost a part of me and um, it was just a feeling of um, lost, like someone died and um, I think the perfect word to use, as Mandinkas will say, suno and suno tale, and um, just lost. What does that mean, the Mandinka phrase? It's it's like a sense of grief and a sense of um, lost of self. Um, I I just now couldn't see the, the my 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 concept of who I thought I was just was very blurry I wasn't sure of who I was anymore or um, what my future hold and the narrative I've been giving myself as to maybe who I was and you know I think I think that um, that changed I just um, I lost a part of too far What happened the next day? I don't know. I know that I, for three days after that, I was really inside. And um, a lot wasn't happening because it's like in Ramadan, so people sleep until late and, and get up to go to the market. So not, um, not much was happening, but I spent the three days there, and my mom have knocked on my door several times and I did let her in but I was in the bed every time she came in and that I was having menstrual cramps which I mostly have and I was not feeling well so she didn't take much into it and I remember when she left the room I would lock my door and I will cry my heart out and I will wipe my tears again and come out I remember her complaining one day she was outside too far too far don't gain a see um, you're always on this phone. I don't know what you you kids, you stay in these rooms on this phone talking and talking because she thought I was on my phone and I wasn't coming out. But also it blended in well because I was a very house person. I'm, I was in the room most of the times if I'm not outside. Um, so for the next three days, I really spent inside the house trying to draft a plan in my head of how I am going to appear fine. Nothing happened. Uh, that, that's, that's really what I was doing. After those, um, well, three days or so, did you speak to anyone about what happened to you? Even I wouldn't accept what happened, so I didn't tell anyone who was there to tell. My mom, I guess, and a mom is just a mother. 
if I had told my mom again, I'm here trying to be protective of her and our family, she, I know my mother, she would not sit down and take it and be quiet. She works at the Ministry of Education. She will try to go tell um, either Auntie Tida or her boss and say, yay, this, you guys, that. And I know she would protest. I know she will not keep quiet. And that would have come with a lot of consequences. Um, so I didn't tell her because I did not want her, I wanted to protect her um, in that space and telling her was not, he was, he couldn't beat Yaya Jame. What is he gonna do, go to the police station and report Yaya Jame? And um, so I felt like she's as hopeless, helpless as I am. And if telling her puts her in more harm way than good, I could not share that very important moment with her. After the rape incident, did anyone from State House call you? Yes, and I think this is when I actually started to think outside of the box or to really reevaluate what this was about again. Just the, the sheer audacity of it all. Jimmy called me, and I wish you could see my face when I stared at that phone with so much amusement. And she said that there is an event that I'm supposed to go to. Jimmy did not talk about what last happened or to ask me how I was feeling or none of that. It was like business as usual that nothing happened. So she just called me, hey, Nakam, and I was like, okay and then she said there's an event that I'm supposed to go to and I was just listening to her to explain this whole event and she said someone is going to pick me up this time around she didn't say landing she said a name that um, I mentioned in the report but I was in, I'm not sure of the pronunciation of that so but she said that someone was coming to pick me up and uh, I would come to this event um, so and the event was not on that day. It was supposed to be on another day, but she's just letting me know in advance so I can prepare for it. Uh, when you, I hung up, sorry? Sorry, you said that when she called, she acted as though um, nothing had happened. Right. Um, from your perspective, you believe that she knew what happened? Yes. Why? Jimbi Jame brought me into the first house in the disguise of waiting for the president. Jimbi Jame moved me to the second house in the disguise of still waiting for the president. When Jimbi Jame somehow went to get water, that is when the president walked in. Um, Jimbi couldn't have not come back there to look for me. Um, when it was time to go home, when I stepped outside, Jimby was there. So there was nothing that Jimby didn't know about. Did Jimby know the details as to um, the insults and the, the, the aggression of Yaya Jamme in the room? I don't know. Um, did Jimby see me crying and clearly not wanted? Yes. Did Jimby hear me say time and time again, I do not want the, I want the marriage, neither the home or the car, right in her presence? So none of this was um, Jimby being a witness or Jimby being a standby. Jimby was the framer, the one who made all of this accessible to him. If she had just let me go and sit in that crowd on that, in that night, maybe it wouldn't happen. It was premeditated by her. So after you hung up the phone, when she called and told you about a future event, um, what happened next? I had a moment to myself, and I came to the realization to stop trying to paint and put a veil over what I think 
this is. It was it wasn't just going to go away. It wasn't. Um until my no somehow becomes a yes and something that I play along with, this is going to continue to happen. Jimby is going to call me, he's going to send someone to pick me up, I would be taken, and whether I do want to have sex or not, it is going to happen, and in the most aggressive way, because that is what I have experienced from him. And me saying I'm not going to come, it's no longer going to work out, I am sick, I am busy, it's no longer going to work out. So I had two options. I either stay there and become everything that I ever, never wanted to be, to become a mistress to the president, to somehow subdue my nose, I'll be picked up and I'll be a sex slave to him, or I leave everything that is so dear to me or everything that I know and to leave. And um, mind you that I've not left that country, this country, and it is all that I have known. Um, I didn't have time to think about it. There was no um, master plan in that moment for me. All I know was that I could not longer be here and in this space. Um, I woke up in the morning. I grabbed the basket to go to the market. Uh, before I did that, I went to GT Bank. I took out $500. I remember calling my auntie in the UK, Marisaho. I told her that she, I want her to send me money, and it is very urgent. She sent me money through um, money transfer. Was it Western Union or um, a local transfer? And I picked up that money. And then I came back. And then um, I remember calling my mom. She's at work. And I told her, I will do the shopping today, that I will do the groceries today. And then I went on to do the groceries. Um, from there, I grabbed a taxi. I went to the terminal in Banju. I did not take a ferry. I had um, um, a hijab, a black one that hides all your face. And then I figured if I had taken um, a ferry, at this point from Yundum to Banjul is an hour. So if I'm being followed and monitored at this point, they would know that I'm no longer in Yundum. And getting on a ferry wasn't an option. Um, I went to the fishermen, or the ones that had a, have a smaller boat, the smaller boats, and I decided to use the smaller boats instead of the ferry and I crossed to the other side of the border. And uh, at this point again, this is the hardest part. It is the border. I have to give in my paperwork or I will be recognized or if they are looking for me, that is the perfect place to be caught. But on my way, I called my mom. I remember before I get to Banju, and I told my mom that I am very, very sorry and that you will not understand right now, but you would, and I will explain to you when I have the time to do so. And my mom was in a conference. She could hardly hear me. She's like, yeah, what? Did you do the groceries? I said, yes. But I do joke a lot, and I do play around a lot, especially with my mom. So she thought it was one of those jokes again. Um, instead of getting a normal um, car that crosses you over, I asked a fuller guy who was driving a truck with um, livestock cows in the back, and there were three spaces in the front. I chose, and I asked him if I could sit in the front. I had an emergency in Senegal. Someone is sick, and I do not have money. And he, say, he said, if you don't mind sitting in between. And I was speaking fuller to him. And that is how I crossed the border um, into the other part of, um, of Senegal. Prior to leaving um, the Gambia, you said you spoke to your aunt in the UK. Right. Did you speak to anyone else um, who lived abroad at the time? Um, in relation to this, I remember speaking to Ahmad Jide, who lives in Canada. 
and also worked for the Fatu network at the Fatu so at the time. And my conversation with Jita wasn't, I didn't tell him what happened. I remember asking him, um, what can one do if one wants to leave um, Gambia? And he asked me, is everything okay? I told him, yes, but I think it's not going to be okay. And Jita did not push or to get into details. But he told me, oh, if you get to Senegal, I know a few people or I know someone there um, that you could talk to. Because even though my grandmother is from Senegal, I could not contact um, family or relatives um, in Senegal. How did you know this Ahmed Jite? Um, Ahmed Jite was a family friend. He lived in Kitty and we lived in Brikama. He was a friend to my bigger sisters and he used to come there. And also he went to Nusrat so, and he was a head boy at some time. So we did interact on that level as they will come to train us on um, NSGA programs and drama stuff. So that's how I knew Jite. So apart from your aunt and Ahmed Jite, did you speak to anyone else who was living abroad at the time? Um, yeah, I was speaking to someone I knew at the time. Uh, was it in relation to leaving the country? No. So you arrived in Senegal. Do you recall the date when you arrived in Senegal? S um, it should be the 23rd. 22nd of June, 22nd or 23rd. You told us earlier that when you unlocked your, when you wanted to unlock your phone, you took it to a guy named Patrick Jaju at QCell. Right. Um, after you called your mother right. using that phone, um, can you tell us what else happened in relation to that phone that you were using? as well as the SIM card. Right. Um, so when I already got to the border to cross into Senegal, um, I took out my SIM card already, but the phone is fine. I'm not going to get access to um, service while on my way to Senegal anyways. But what I realized it when I got to Senegal, which was in the middle of the night, I took a set plus to Senegal. Um, I'm assuming now in hindsight, back home, um, it has already been noted that I have been away for a day and almost a whole night. So my phone was blocked. So when I opened my phone, on the screen of my phone, it said, um, phone is reported stolen. Um, please call number three something something. And that number is Jimmy's personal number that was on it. So whatever happened, in order to get the ability to do that, you have to get back to the Apple ID or the iCloud or the setup of the phone to report um, that iPhone stolen. So I could not get access to um, that phone, the pictures on that phone, or um, some of the informations on that phone. Yeah. We know that you currently live in Canada. So can you just briefly tell us what happened in Senegal that then led to your um, travel to Canada? Briefly? Right. Just briefly, yes. Right. Um, so when I got there, the first person that um, I contacted was Ibrahim Chongan, whose number was given to me by Ahmed Jite. I contacted Chongan and Chongan told me there was someone he knew in Senegal who worked for the security service at the time. And, but it was very late, so when I called the guy, he was not um, available until the next day. This guy, whose name is Umar Top in Senegal, um, was the first person that I actually explained the whole scenario to. And um, I then went to Article 19 to Anti Fatui Jang in Article 19. I went to Amnesty International. I went to um, Trial International as well in Dakar. And then I met the head of police at the time through Omar Top, um, whom I also explained to you. Now, um, what the head of police at the time related back to me was that 
um, as we were in the car, me, him, and Omar Top, was that the Gambia government has reported that I am missing. So they received a call from the office of the president telling them that I went missing, that I'm some teenage girl who went missing, and my mother is looking for me all over the place. So if they find me, let them return me back. Um, the head of police reported back to the Minister of Interior at the time that I am not a missing child, I am not lost, um, I, I actually got violated by him, and that I am in Dakar. And that is what actually fast-paced my, my stay in Senegal or me leaving for Canada. And through that, because they had to hasten the process, I was introduced, I was taken to UNCHR, um, where I also went over my case again with them of what happened. And um, UNCHR then, I think they will give the case or introduce it to the different countries like the UK and the US and Canada. And whoever thought it was a um, good case for them to give the person a protected person status or not. Um, and Canada first responded. And then I met a caseworker from Canada, immigration caseworker. We went through my case again, just like all the informations here with furniture, with relations, who is who, what did I do, what happened. We went through all of that and they said I had to give them some time to do some investigations and they will get back to me. And uh, by June, July and August 6th of 2015, before that, they um, got back to me that they have accepted my case. They think I am a legitimate person to give a protected person status. And um, then I was connected to IOM, which is the International Organization for Migrants. And then they did my paperwork. And um, I had flew back. And then I flew to Canada on the 6th of August. Now, within this span, as this was happening, I never could speak to my mom directly or my dad, and um, um, because I didn't want them to call, I don't want to call them and they will see a Senegal, a Senegal number or that it was me. But I did relate to my auntie in the UK, Marie, who had always told them that I was fine, that I'm okay, and also to tell them what to say in order for them not to be bothered because they were going to the police or is it the NIA to report, they kept asking them where I was, what happened, where I was. And then I remember telling Auntie Marie to tell my sister and my mom to tell them that I just went to Senegal for business or something. It's not like they can know or catch me where I'm at because I was actually in a very protected place. Um, so they did that and that kind of gave them some uh, a sense of peace because they were not um, bothering them anymore. And in the same time, whilst I was in Senegal, um, Fatul Amin Fai, uh, the Minister of Education at the time, is who connected the police um, to my mother to check about me, my inquiry, and where I was. My younger sister was taken, Panda, who was um, um, 15 or 16 years old at the time. Um, my mom also had to go in to answer and they kept answering the same questions. And luckily, because I've never really told them what happened, even if they had want to kill them or put a gun to their head, their answer was going to be the same because they did not know either um, um, what was happening. But this is the summary of my time in Senegal and how I ended up in um, Canada. So you said when your family members were taken, meaning your mom and your sister, yeah. this was the process of being questioned by the police and the NIA, is yeah. that correct? Yes. You mentioned that at some point the Senegalese received information from the office of the president in the Gambia right. saying that you were missing. A teenager was missing. A yeah. teenager was missing. And then you said that whole entire thing hastened your departure. Yes. From Dakar. What do you mean by that? Like what um, what actually hastened the, the departure? Right. 
Um, so because the call is being made that I am missing, and because it's a missing person, um, Senegal, of course, gave consent, or the officials who were responsible gave consent to, of course, if we find uh, the missing teenager, we will send her back. But now that they have heard from me and my story and what has happened, um, they thought it was easier to get me out of the country quickly than to have that confrontation with Yaya Jamme of, oh, we found her, but it's not what you are saying, she's actually violated and all of that. So they do not have to want to have that confrontation as they've already had this issue with Yaya Jamba where he believes Senegal where was keeping his um, 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 refugees or people that did not agree with him. Um, so I think I, that's what I mean when I say it kind of hastened the process. So you spent less than two months in Senegal and then arrived in Canada um, in August 2015. Yes. Considering everything that you had been through, um, the rape incident, leaving your family, fleeing to Dakar, um, and then moving to Canada, can you tell us what impact this entire experience has had on you, as well as your family? It is an overnight shift of my life. It is. Um, one minute I am a um, 19 year old going to college in the Gambia. The next minute I am a refugee in Senegal who cannot talk to anybody that I love. The third is me finding myself in a world that um, I did not see coming and um, all by myself and um, having to figure it all out quickly and um, I couldn't, um, I had to isolate myself because there's already rumors going on about oh the president wanted to marry her and then she ran and because that was a, a more comfortable conversation to have and of course because I never told anyone that I've been raped in isolation completely, I um, did not integrate into the Gambian community or talk to anyone. Um, I wasn't seeing any Gambian family for any type of um, moral, physical, or just social um, life. I had to leave and adopt this whole other um, social norm. Whilst my parents at home had to deal with the consequences of something they haven't even fully understood yet. They're getting questioned. They're not sure if I am fine. They do not understand why I even left. And even after making it to Canada, to just even tell my mom that this is why I left was so hard. And um, I was so... Um, desperate, I was so alone, and I felt so lost as to what to do next, what not to do next. I felt a gap and a distance between me and my mother, because we will talk about things and um, we will talk about it roughly, but there was this thing that was always holding me back and was holding her back. She wanted to ask some questions, but she was very scared what the answers would be. So. It gapped our relationship for a while. I felt very distant um, because there was this part of me that I do not want to accidentally come out of my mouth. Whilst I was there, I am receiving messages from um, the beauty pageants that I have competed with, telling me, um, God will reward you for your wickedness because me running away um, on lies and something they do not understand if happens or not somehow jeopardizes their chances of um, scholarship or whatever it was that they were supposed to have. Me running away kind of Tanis's Jammes image and he's now mad at the whole group so now the other girls have to pay for the consequences of me running away. Now I am sitting there with that guilt um, but I cannot also say that this is why 
I ran away. I didn't just get up. I didn't have a master plan. I ran away is because I was being used and I was being abused. And uh, I could not let that continue to happen. Um, my dad, in fact, a bigger distance because he's a man and is a fuller culture. And um, they were very proud of me and my potential and what I could have become. But I could not see that part of me even though I was in a free world where all the opportunities were in front of me, it took me a long, long time to find myself. You said the other, con um, the other winners of the pageant contacted you. Right. Um, how were they able to get your contact information? On Messenger, actually, Facebook Messenger. On Facebook Messenger. Right. You talked about the process that you went through and um, maybe you can tell us whether you received any counseling while you were in Canada. And um, if yes, maybe tell us the process that then led you um, to this moment um, this year where you told your story in June and then you're coming here now to tell the Gambian people um, in the context of the TRC. Right. Um. I did receive a lot of um, counseling. I mean, I cannot imagine. I don't think I would be able to do this if I was still in the Gambia. I, I, I doubt 100% that I will be able to do it. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of um, redefining myself. I um, was sifting from... Um, counselor to counselor, but it was offered to me. Um, the first year when I lived in a shelter, a refugee shelter for that one year, um, there was a counselor there, but a general counselor. Uh, but then when I was able to move out of the shelter, then I was, I had another counselor as well. But it's just being a whole um, redefining of who I think I am. I had to go deep down into my childhood. I had to go um, deep down into the pageant towards it. All that um, I had trauma with. Um, it was a very painful process, but it was a process that um, did not give me back the part of me that I lost, but it gave me back um, a new part of um, what I can be. Being a fuller girl, um, a very proud one for that matter, from a wall of mother and a full of father. It was um, an identity crisis, um, talking about what happened to me in comparison to what it is that we used to say whether a woman has a value or doesn't have a value, and knowing um, the culture that I came from. So I got to a point that I could tell my therapist everything, that I was allowed to break down. I was allowed to um, go through the phase of um, being depressed and not wanting to talk to anybody, taking on more jobs, like um, doing four jobs in a day from one shift to another because I do not want to be home. Because when I'm home, I have to think about this and I have to process it. So I'm becoming a walk junkie, overworking myself. Um, um, waking up some days and not wanting to be here. But then, I have to be, keep keep up this persona that people wanted, you know, that I am fine. And while sitting there, people are speculating all sorts of things, and I can't come out, I can't say, oh, not this happened, this happened, not that happened. No, I was just letting all the stories flow around, and that is affecting my mother, because even though I am in Canada and getting this counseling, she's here, within this culture. And, um, for me to come out, I am saying that I'm going to make my mom and my dad and my family relieve this again. I am putting them in the front of the world, exposing them to insults and doubts, to question their racing abilities, um, making them catch up 
with a society that might not catch up with them in their lifetime. That is the burden I have put on them. And but I came to the fact and the conclusion that I can still be a fuller girl. I can still be a Gambian. Yaya Jambe is not more Gambian than me. He's not more cultured than I am. Um, um, to allow my identity to be taken away from me because I feel like my story does not fit in it was something I could not leave with for the rest of my life. So I had to redefine who I was. Um, that is to accept my story. And not just to accept it, but to, to tell my story in as, as, as crazy as it might sound um, in this culture and in this space and to take whatever backlash comes with it so that the next person and the other people that come will be getting lesser and lesser of a backlash um, and that it becomes okay and that you can be powerful, you can move on with your life, you can be educated, you can be broken and then build up, you can be depressed some days and some days not, but it is okay and it doesn't make you less of a fuller, a mandinka, a jola or any of our tribes um, that makes us Gambian. Ms. Jala, thank you very much for answering all my questions. I have come to the end. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hand over to the commissioners for any additional questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Council. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Semafatu Tufajalo, for your testimony. Very lucid and articulate. Uh, truly sorry again to you uh, for the suffering that you endured. Um, if I say anything, I believe you had indicated that, uh, or stated that uh, the sexual assault on you by former President Yai Jame took place at State House. Is that correct? Yes. Indeed. Um, Incredible. Two days in a row, we heard here uh, Commander of State House of Guards raping a young, vulnerable woman in the State House in his office. Today, we hear that the President and the Commander in Chief of the Republic of the Gambia raped a young and vulnerable woman in a state house. This is just not um, assault on these young vulnerable women. It was an assault on the, the Gambia as a whole because it's the national house of the Gambia that was used as a venue for the commission of these heinous um, crimes. We're truly sorry about that, that uh, you had to endure this. And the, the assault is not just on the two of you that we have heard here in State House, but also on the entire country. You cannot use the National House of the Gambia as a house for rape by the highest officers of the state. Truly sorry what you had gone through again. Commissioners, if you have any questions, please indicate. If not, oh, please go ahead, Madam Deputy Chief. I mean, Deputy uh -huh. <laughs> Chair. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Tufa. Uh, I just wanted to know about your younger sister. Where is she now? Um, she's here. Um, in the Gambia and also in the audience, yeah. When she was held in custody, I hope it was, she didn't undergo any torture or whatever? No, she didn't. It was more verbal, but um, um, nobody touched her. Nobody yeah. touched her. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Jones, please. Thank you, Ms. Jalom, for sharing your testimony with us. Um, just one question regarding um, the other girls that you were with, that is your badge. 
um, whilst you were being invited to State House and receiving what you believed was a gift for being um, the, the winner of the competition or of the scholarship pageant. Do you know at any point, or did you speak to any of the other girls, or did you hear rumors here and there that they were also being invited and receiving gifts as well? Right. Um, I, I never heard of it, because we never talk about it as a group, and I've never heard the rumors either. And we were not very that much close, so we will go to public events, but when we disperse, we are not as close to a, a point that we will be going to each other's home or spending more time outside of the events that we were having together. So none of the girls ever reported that to me, and I, I did not hear that too. Okay, so as far as you know, you were probably the only girl in your batch in 2014. As far as I know, to my knowledge and with my experience, um, unless another girl wants to, maybe, yeah. Okay, um, this is a question that I posed yesterday to Tida Jata, right. Madam Tida Jata, representing the ministry, um, to ask whether any formal investigation was um, instituted to find out the magnitude or veracity of some of the rumors that were ongoing about the girls. And I know the Deputy Lead Council asked the question earlier um, whether you, why didn't, regarding you speaking out and you explained um, some of the factors hindering you speaking out at the time, including um, your mother. Um, in your final remarks, it will be very good if you could also make recommendations, not just to girls, but also to boys who are also facing such challenges and might face them, find themselves in such situations and right. might not want to speak out. So it would be very right. good if you can speak out as an right. ambassador to a lot of them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ms. Jello, if you may. Oh, Imam C, you have the floor, please. Interpretation. Imam said they are very happy for her. The sufferings you encountered, with all that, you decided to come and reveal your story. The sufferings you encountered, with all that, you decided to keep it as a secret. Even your parents, you decided to hide the story from them. That's all because of you had a good mind. This is because of you don't want to create problems for them. But on that, we, we beg you, we appeal to you to forgive. Jimbe, Jimbe. Jimbe, kanku, 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 is she married or not? Um, Joni ni mo equatorial Guinea. Tong, kotong, kanku ya jambe ya duno. Right, right now, Jimbe is in equatorial Guinea, and she left the Gambia with ya ya jambe, and that's where she is up to date. Gila mo Gambia ga mi anda mo hebu golgorko. When she was in the Gambia here, I didn't hear that she had got, she had got married to anybody. Um, but uh, between these few days, we heard that she is married to somebody who is in Sweden. That's all what I know. Thank you. Um, before you proceed to make your uh, final remarks, if you have any, Ms. Jallo. Can you just clarify, after the president assaulted you sexually at State House, did he go down to join the GAMO? If you have any idea. Yes. He did? Yes. Please proceed with your final remarks. Yes. Um, the interpreters, I would like to um, go on with my um, last statement, half of it in Mandinka and half of it in English, if that's okay. 
If you can just um, allow for a few seconds, I'll give you an indication shortly. Yes, you may proceed. Thank you. Um, I hereby extend my sincerest regards to the commissioners and I'm also thanking, thanking them. Um, I hereby extend my sincerest regards to the commissioners my thanks to the Gambian people too for, for setting up something like this TRRC. Because the TRRC belongs to the Gambians. Um, I know that I'm not used to uh, this type of uh, 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 speeches. And I know that also uh, it is not like it is a, a, a single person who raped me. Bankola uh, Manso it is the head of state who did it to me. And I know that to believe that is very difficult for some people. And I know that a lot of people will find it difficult to believe this and some people will also uh, 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 think how to make it easy for them. Um, if you are a female, uh, and you live in a culture whereby it is believed that women should be quiet, and it is a type of culture whereby even if the woman is going to die, she should keep quiet. It's, an, it's a culture whereby they have to keep secrets. Um, I was born in that culture, that's the culture I come from, and that's the culture where I grew up. And I understand that very well. My mom is within that same culture. My father is within the same culture. But... But the country reaches, goes to a position whereby my mother and father, they go to the garden, they are selling, they are trying day and night to educate us. That education should be a fruit. It's not like that I'm sitting in an office wearing suits. But also our education should make us try and change a lot of things for our parents. Whereby we know where our parents went through. We shouldn't say that that's what we are going to do because it's culture. There is a very bad culture. There are bad cultures. There are good cultures existing. If you are thinking like your great great grandparents, how they were thinking. Then we will be here today burying our children. Or we will be, uh, 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 we will be worshiping idols. Because this is what our great great grandparents were doing. But what has happened? How the, the nation goes. People said no. 
Let's look at it again. Let's change things. What is not good, let's try to do away with that. Let's try and install what is good and let's make it big. But to change that is going to is always very difficult. If you find somebody sitting, um, you are killing and they are, they are holding to one single culture, you come a small child, you want to fight against that culture, they will fight you too. They will insult you. Um, they can approach you by any way. But I think, however strong that culture is, this culture that we are uh, 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 following, the, the culture of keeping things secret, we all should agree that that culture is not good. Our girls, our boys, they are people, powerful, powerful people in the country, um, uh, uh, doing wrong things to those children. Uh, they are forcing themselves on these children. Um, they are telling or doing things to these children, things that these children should not know at that tender age. And now you are telling those people to keep quiet on those things. Because we want to keep secrets. We don't want to disgrace the family. Why the reason is that? Why the person who committed this grave sin is not ashamed of himself? Why is his family not ashamed of it? The reason why I came out, I want all of us to know that. Even if we close our eyes, we, we pretend to be blind, we take the, uh, uh, the blinds and throw it on the bed, we pretend to be ignorant of what's going on. We know what's going on. In the offices, at the, at the, at the madrasas, we powerful people in the military, everywhere, even in the market. That thinking, to think that, if somebody has more money than you, or his position is higher than yours, or he has given sweets to children, or a woman, or a girl, this is why he has the right to force himself on that child or on that woman. It is that society who agreed to those bad things. It is because of us, those people thought that, when we do it, they will not say anything. They will say that the child is telling lies, the woman is telling lies. They will say, look at her, she's a strong-headed person. Even if that person is stubborn like a stone, even if he has hundred children, that gives nobody any right to touch the woman or to talk about her to force her or to rape her when she doesn't like it. Um, so I'll get into some part of English now. Um, the main disguise of the um, July 22nd pageant was um, women empowerment. That was very emphasized, that was very much in the forefront of all the ads. Um, to me, it has been an awakening as a woman, and I hope that it is an awakening to other women as well. 
For 22 years in this country, we have been under the disguise of um, um, women empowerment and empowerment of all sorts. And I think women of the Gambia have endured more when it comes to ridicule, when it comes to disrespect, and it, when it comes to parading something in a way that we serve as a token instead of actual members of the society. Um, we have not been taken seriously. Our self-worth has been measured based on how great of EI campaigns we are, how great we clap our hands for political leaders and politicians and people in power. Um, we have been given a token, for example, we have been given a vice president who is a female. Um, even though she might have been a symbol, she might have been placed there to um, satisfy that narrative of women empowerment, you go deeper into the issues and you realize that that female that was put there was not actually having any direct effect on decision making. Um, uh, there was no actual power given to her to make actual changes in um, direct lives of women. Um, we were told to come on stages to perform in the names of scholarships um, that some of us did not get. So mind you, there are girls that did get their scholarships and I am happy for them. I am glad that they did get um, to have that because that is the reason why we did it in the first place. Um, I will not take their stories away from them. Um, you got your scholarship, you went and studied. Yeah, I Jambe maintained a father figure with you. That is all great. I would never deny that. Um, but that doesn't mean it was the same for me. And you could tell your story and accept that nothing happened to you without taking away what is mine. And mine is something happened to me. Um, and I know that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, mentioning Yajambe's name, mentioning rape, and mentioning the exact things that happened to me because it's something that we do not do or have never seen before. And I know most people are not, um, they do not have issue with the story or what happened. They have an issue with what I represent. They have an issue with a survivor who is a woman and who is owning her truth. That makes a lot of people uncomfortable, and I get that. Um, but it's okay to be uncomfortable as a society before we will be able to sift anything around. And from when I came in in June up to now, I haven't accused any political party of rape. I accused a man of rape who happened to be the president of this country. Um, if anybody wants to own that on his behalf, that is okay. But I accused Yaya Jame of rape. And I think what we should ask ourselves is when women do come out to speak, especially women that has been on this TRRC, it's okay to have questions and it's okay to have doubts and to also give benefit of the doubt. But maybe what a lot of people should ask themselves to check in their own internal biases or what makes them uncomfortable is to ask themselves why it is so hard to give the woman that has put in everything on the line to come in front of the world to expose her family and herself and her, her identity because it is reshaped. It is harder to give her the benefit of the doubt than to give to the man who is accused who hasn't said a word hasn't defended themselves, hasn't even given you a story. But it is more comforting to somehow um, give the benefit of the doubt to the silent, unknown, unspoken man than to do to a woman who spends hours and hours explaining her story over and over and over again. I think that begs the question of checking what our biases are. Um, I am grateful for the women that have come forward, I am grateful for the women that continue to speak their truth. And I hope that the TRC, as we have seen, has taken seriously the issue of gender-based violence. That is also a very essential part of um, um, what the end results of this is, what the recommendations would be for um, us as we head into our next chapter as a country. 
um, it will be unfortunate, it would have been very unfortunate to move on to the next chapter of this country without addressing the abuse that has been done to women over and over again. Um, when it comes to recommendations, really, I think as a country and an institution and a government, to be very clear about projects that are being put forward, um, to have actual paperwork of what is expected, what is supposed to be done, and who does what, instead of being a vague people who run our institutions like we run our homes and in the markets where we'll just say, um, kare mune, kare mune. he said, she said, do this, go to that one, and don't go to that one. To have it more systematic in a way that it is publicized, the information, um, on any project, especially if it involves vulnerable people. Um, also, it will be a great initiative to include social work in our college and our universities. Um, their perpetrators, their survivors, their victims. In between all of that, there is um, a gap, a significant gap of um, help and um, people that will listen and care and know um, and have a huge, great human resource to not have a nation that is half traumatized, half battered, and the, no one really has any source of um, professional support or help or believe and trust in confidentiality. Knowing that walking to a police station does not solve your problem makes that police station just a building with people in it. Um, I think building that capacity from the Gambia College to the university will help as we graduate social workers and um, uh, case workers and people that will actually contribute to the human resource um, of this country. Um, that being said, I, um, I, can, I, I think this is um, as much as I have right now. And I know usually when we are done speaking, we do say that I am sorry if I offend anybody. Well, I know who this offends. It offends Yaya Jamme. It offends men like Yaya Jamme. It offends men who want to sympathize with perpetrators um, and to those people, I am not sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Diallo, uh, for your testimony, and we really appreciate your coming to um, uh, uh, participate in our proceedings. This brings us um, uh, to the end of um, uh, the eighth. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll get to her. Yeah, just give me a second. Um, to the end of the eighth um, uh, session. Sorry, the ninth. Ninth, um, yes. <laughs> ninth session of our um, uh, public um, uh, proceedings. Uh, Council, you have a, a procedural point to raise? It is indeed a procedural one. Thank um, you. I wanted to tender into evidence the aid memoir that uh, Ms. Jala was using to help her with the dates. So it's the photographs that she was looking through to help her plot events, and that would be as um, Exhibit 0096, with your permission, of course. Uh, request them are granted. Ed Memoirs, uh, great contributors um, to dossiers. So your request is um, granted. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one thing. So the TUFA Foundation is having a women's convening on sexual assault on the 12th um, of um, November. And so everybody can either check in or check our website. And all women are invited. It is a forum for West African organizations that are fighting sexual violence to come together to discuss terms and policies we have currently. So everyone is invited. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as I was saying, this brings us to the end of the ninth um, uh, session, the three-week session. We will resume our public hearings in slightly different format that the executive secretary would just try to clarify that on the 11th of um, November. In the meantime, the commission is not going out of business. We are continuing our work uh, um, in committees and also outreach um, programs. Uh, executive secretary, can you clarify what the format of the 11th session is likely to be. And then council later on, if you have something to add on to it, you can go ahead and do it. Uh, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you to and the family for 
coming to help us in this important work. Um, our next session will be on the witch hunts. You all know about the witch hunts, right? Um, of 2009. Um, it will start on November 11th, and um, it will include having regional hearings. So uh, unlike the sessions that we've had so far, this is going to be a four-week session um, because of the extent of um, the violations that uh, will be examined. So week one of the 10th session will start on November 11, and it will continue until November 14. Now, that session will be held here inside the hearing hall. So it's not going to be held outside. It will be here, just like the normal um, session of hearings. Um, and it will include witnesses from the greater Banjul area. Now, week two of session 10 will run from November 18 to 21. And it will be a hearing on witch hunts in Jambur. Jambur, of course, is um, in the West Coast region. And week three of session 10 runs from the 25th to the 28th of November. And um, it will include witch hunting hearings in Fonyi. Now, for now, we're thinking that the hearings will be held either in Sintet or in Sibarnor or some other place. So we have a team, we have a task force uh, of the Secretariat that is uh, working on the logistics. Then ordinarily, the session would have ended on November 28th, but like I said, it is going to be a four-week session. So week four of session 10 will start, will run from December 2nd to December 5th, and it will be on uh, witch hunting in SL, like the North Bank region. So essentially, that would be um, what will happen between uh, November 11th and December 5th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, for that program information. Council, uh, you have um, something to add on to the substance of um, uh, what this program information is about. I, I uh, have nothing on, to on say. On witch hunting? I have nothing to nothing say. Nothing to add on to those ones. Fine. Um, uh, the in program information, as I said, is the one that's just been given to you. Uh, it's a slightly different format, so I wanted them to just explain that um, uh, to you. So we will see you uh, no, um, December, sorry, November 11th, and uh, uh, we will continue our work um, in the committees and the outreach programs. Thank you all very much. Our meeting is adjourned.